Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the last session of the Responsible Tourism Programme at WTM Virtual this year. We've got a lively panel. I'm quite nervous about chairing this group. There's some people here with very strong opinions about the future of sustainable and responsible tourism. What we want to do this afternoon is to continue the theme of all eight of the panels we've had this year, which is to focus on solutions. I'm going to go around and introduce the panel as I ask the first question question to each of them in a few minutes. What I think is clear is that we've had a, a, an intermission, if you like, a break in the development of tourism. It's an opportunity to reflect on what's gone well and what's gone badly wrong over the last 20 years. The question I think we need to focus on is how we build back better and what we need to do to make a change. The title of this session was about can we make tourism better? The obvious answer to that question is yes, of course we could. I think the question is whether we will, and that's probably where the focus of this afternoon's discussion will go. But Jane, if I could start with, with you, you and I, I think, and, and Justin as well, we're, the, we're probably the only people still actively around who were involved with the Sustainable Tourism Initiative before the World Summit on Sustainable Development in Cape Town in 2002. Um, and that's when I first met you. And since then, you've been with 2E uh, as Director of Sustainability and now with EasyJet. Jane, how do you see us girding our loins to push on into the next period? What are your priorities moving forward now as we go into a, hopefully a, a, a post-COVID world or perhaps a world where we have to live with COVID, but we need to get back to some kind of normality? Where are we going next with the sustainability agenda? Well, have, hi everybody and thank you Harold for pointing out how long I've been around. Um, but, um, uh, I would say it's useful to reflect because um, for well, well over 15 years or more um, I've been um, working on integrating sustainability through mainstream tourism and working with uh, trade associations uh, and different bodies to create, uh, create um, tools, to create demonstration projects, pilot projects, um, to understand how to manage, measure, and implement processes to improve tourism. Um, so I think um, a number of them have been, uh, well, certainly very useful to me, like um, the uh, Travel Life um, um, Sustainability uh, Accommodation Certification and the other Global Sustainable Tourism um, Council certifications. Um, the criteria, the GSTC criteria for destination management um, projects um, to, uh, to, to seek to uh, measure and increase local economic benefits, um, uh, etc. Um, and I think, the, I think the opportunity now is to actually implement those in a much more mainstream way. They're still worth too niche prior to COVID. And there's been, you know, there's no doubt that the pandemic has been absolutely devastating. Um, and you know, for, for businesses, um, for individuals, and particularly for the tourism industry. Um, so if I was to look for some uh, silver linings, I'd say that um, if people have had a, a, quite a sort of existential shock um, through the pandemic, and what stayed really clear and increased during that period is people's concern for climate change, is people's concern for each other, concern for community, um, awareness of the social and economic benefits um, that, of, of, of tourism that we had before, and I think appreciation of how that can be improved. Um, so I think that gives you know, a, an opportunity to, um, to build tourism back better. Um, some of the sort of key things that have changed over the course of the year, aside from the, from the pandemic, um, and um, you know, in terms of people's perceptions, public perceptions. Um, we looked at some uh, research this week, um, over 95% of, of, of the public are as if not more concerned with climate change than they were at the beginning of the pandemic. And you see that research, that type of research um, again and again. Um, just since the end of last year, you've seen uh, businesses setting net zero targets increasing threefold. And I think that's um, that, that's, that's really um, going to change the general business agenda, even those in the, in the, in the travel industry, and particularly in aviation, um, that's um, you know, struggling to make um, 
uh, short to medium term decarbonisation commitments um, are going to be very much uh, affected by what is now business as usual. You've seen governments um, come back with or looking at the, the, uh, the EU um, uh, green recovery about uh, their stimulus package. About a third of that is going to be um, delivered through green bonds. Um, you see what's happened at the weekend, thank, thank goodness, with, um, with, with the election, you've now got the UK, the EU, uh, China and the US committed to um, a net zero world within a generation, and that's two thirds of global GDP. So, you know, the, 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 the whole uh, background scenario has changed a lot during this year. Um, and uh, I think unsustainable business practices uh, are not what customers are going to be expecting when they go on holiday. And we need to reflect that in the, in the offerings that we, that we provide uh, and the work that we do with destinations. And hopefully, Joan, if they're not going to expect it, they're not going to accept it either. When they, Absolutely mm, not, no. Can I go next to you, Manda? We, I've known you for a while. Um, I'm very nervous about having you on a panel because you are such a brilliant disruptor. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure you're about to disrupt this panel. But uh, how do you think we move this agenda forward? Because clearly we've not made enough progress over the last 20 years, have we? No, we haven't. Um, thanks for that, Harold. And um, thanks, Jane. I think it's really useful to get that um, context and landscape uh, out there front and centre. I think my thinking around this is, no, we haven't achieved enough. Um, we've done some good stuff. Uh, we've just been making bad things a little bit less bad rather than actually transforming in the way that we really need to. And I think for me, it's a little bit like um, if we're not careful, it's about tourism being at one end of the boat and having a hole. There's lots of other holes. And we just think that by making our hole a little bit smaller, it's all going to be okay but it's still a hole and there are still lots of other holes so it's everything we're doing is not good enough yet um so my to penneth is uh, a couple of things that spring into mind i think the best thinkers and doers at the moment are first of all doing some really good thinking think understanding that we are in a combined health and climate and ecological crisis and they are all connected uh, and if we don't consider them all as a whole, um, they will continue. So part of the, the health climate, the health crisis has come about because of many things, but encroachment on natural habitat, which comes out of development and tourism has been, been playing a part in that. So we need to understand that they we are at a nexus of tricky things and do some good thinking around that. We need to understand where to start thinking about this. For me, it isn't about how does the industry survive. I think it has to be how do places survive and how does the industry contribute to that and understand that sometimes it doesn't do a good job and sometimes it does a good job um, and understand the difference. We have to discern um, uh, what the people and places need and, and the systems that they rely on, what is required for that thriving to take place. Um, and that looks at models around local ownership and loan um, uh, resilience and uh, localism in a way that we haven't really done properly yet. Um, I think it needs some agile and um, humble thinking in terms of understanding what the response to those multiple crises will be um, in, in the context of them, them all interlocking. Like what would actually be the thing that would sort out those crises, not what is the thing that will sort out the industry. And that will allow us to put things in the right order. Mm. I think we need to think in systems, not in straight lines. We are really rubbish at thinking in systems. We're really good at thinking in straight reductionist lines. So we need to understand that one thing over here will have an impact on something over here, that by developing um, an industry over here might sort out one part of our problem, but might be causing a problem somewhere else. We need to start thinking in systems. And then we need to be courageous. And so as well as thinking in systems, we also need to be courageous and imaginative and understand what the benefits are of travel and tourism. And they are many psychologically and in terms of our um, humanity and connection, they are many. So I think our question is, how do we capture those benefits and how do we keep them? And what does the industry do to, do to allow us to do that rather than how do we keep the industry going? Because the industry won't be able to continue in the way that it's developed, even within the next 12 months, three years, five years, everything has changed now. And we need to step up to that massive change and walk into it and decide what is it want. And some of that will be deciding some of us don't get to have as much as we want and we might need to share better mm. because some people have had a much worse time out of this than others. Some people have made a great deal of money and we need to do a little bit of thinking and honest, um, uh, some proper dismantling of where we think the benefit has gone and where in future it needs to go. Otherwise, we are still in that boat thinking that making our hole a little bit less awful is a reasonable contribution to a very holy boat, which it isn't. 
that's my two penneth. Manda, one of the things that, thank you, um, you, you are as ever a disruptor. One of the things that people have been saying to me is the realization that in the same way that you, you can isolate yourself a bit from COVID, but you can't isolate yourself from what it does to your community. Yeah. With climate change, you can't even isolate yourself from the impact of climate change. It's not yeah. just, you know, it's gonna come and get you. Yeah. And you can only really deal with it as part of a community. You can't deal with it on your own. Justin Francis, CEO of Responsible Travel, been around nearly as long as Jane and I in this field. Um, what's your take on the future, Justin? How do you think we get this thing to roll? Because clearly we haven't made enough progress over the last 20 years. I think the first thing, Harold, is that um, just I'm very sensitive and I'm very aware of the number of people who are out of work, Yes. perhaps placed in poverty because they're out of work. Mm. I'm very aware of the conservation programs that have folded or struggled as a result yeah. of declines in bookings, which we've seen at Responsible Travel and across, across the industries. So first up, rescue. That's yeah. what we need to do. Um, but secondly, turning to green recovery. I think the question is not what do we need to do? All of us on the panel can articulate what a nature positive, carbon negative, mm. more fair and equal tourism industry looks like. I suspect all of those looking and watching this could also articulate that. The question more is about how do we accelerate progress? And my hypothesis for change is that you get change in systems, you get change in destinations, you get change in industry sectors, when you get to what I'm calling the 30-30-30 point, when you have a third of a destination or a third of an industry sector who are progressive around responsible tourism and doing good things that leaves you with another third in the middle who tend to watch. But if you've got a third of them watching, a third of them progressing, they tend to move with progress as well. And that leaves you with another third typically. And that, and that third is much slower, unable or unwilling to change. And that's where we need to be much tougher yeah. and we need to legislate. And the reason we need to legislate is those who are doing good things in destinations or good things in their industry sectors need to know that those who are not progressing are held to account. You have to do both things. At the top, yeah. progressive action. At the bottom, you have to legislate. So my assessment of where we are right now is we have progressed. I think all the work that has been done over the last 10, 20 years has shown results. But if you ask me, do we have a third of the destinations or a third of the industry sectors who are really dynamic and progressive around responsible tourism? No, we don't. We're somewhere in the five to 10 percent area. So what do we need? We need more established businesses. We need new entrepreneurs. Big call out to new entrepreneurs. We need you mm. in this space. We need destination managers who are enlightened. We need conservation and cultural heritage managers who are pushing for responsible tourism. We need to move the 5% of the progressives to a 30% of the progressives. And in terms of the bottom third, um, we need choice editing by destination managers. Select in responsible tourism activity, select out irresponsible tourism activity. We need science-based targets for carbon. We need, uh, around biodiversity, we need biodiversity net gain commitments. It's interesting in the UK planning law now, if you're a housing developer, you are required to deliver a 10% biodiversity net gain. We need that kind of thinking in the tourism industry. And we need more disclosure around equality too. So just wrapping it up, um, the leaders, established or new, we need more of them. And at the bottom end, we need to all toughen up and have more teeth. So that's a kind of framework, if you like, or a hypothesis for change. Because, Justin, that's how industries have always made progress, isn't it? By the leaders bringing mm -hmm. along the middle and then the regulators cause the, the people at the bottom, the freeloaders, if you like, yeah. to comply with the better practices which have from other areas, but it's not really been applied to sustainability yet. John, you, um, John Swarbrook, who um, has a, a long academic career and has recently retired. John, you write the Bible really on sustainable tourism. People still recognize the importance of the book you wrote. How are you feeling about that book now? <laughs> there I was, Harold. 
I, I prepared wonderfully along the question you were going to ask me. And you asked <laughs> Go me back to the question I was going to ask you. Tell me what the question was and answer that one. That's fine. No, it's fine. I'll, I'll come back to that at the end, if I may. And so no, I'll do, yeah. say a few other, make a few other comments in, in the meantime. First of all, totally agree with everything that's just been said, and particularly by Justin. And I think our thoughts have to absolutely be with the workers who've suffered enormously in what's happened and not always been treated well. In terms of building better tourism, building it back better, the first thing I think I would love to say is, can we stop talking about when air travel will get back to pre-COVID levels, as if that was somehow a sign that we were having going to be having success? Because I don't believe that was a sustainable level of air travel in the context of climate change. And I think it also had a, a really unpleasant element to it in that it assumes that numbers are what tourism is all about and how we evaluate tourism. I think it's about the quality of the tourism we have, not just whether we've got more people sitting on aeroplanes visiting destinations than we used to have. So that worries me a little bit. On the other hand, I'm very encouraged by the recent uh, developments that appear to be taking place in the reduction of the carbon footprint of air travel potentially in the future. I think that's really excellent seeing that. But I do think we've got to recognise it's going to be a few years before that actually is fully implemented. So there is going to be almost a transition period when we still have to get air travel down somehow or other before those things kick in, when hopefully things will change again for the better for those who are in the long haul travel business. I would like to see governments and industry focusing more on domestic and short haul travel as well in that meantime period. And also on trying to integrate visitors more into local communities, a lot more like living like a local, rather than two totally parallel populations inhabiting similar areas of space. I also recognise that if we are going to reduce long haul air travel over the next few years for environmental reasons, it will have a disproportionate impact on poorer countries and particularly in the south. There's no argument about that. That absolutely is right. And I think we as richer countries have got some responsibility here to actually make sure that in some way that, that compensation in effect takes place and that also they're assisted to diversify economies during that period because they will suffer far more than we will. If there's a lot of increase in domestic tourism, we here in Cornwall, in fact, in the UK, will do extremely well, thank you very much indeed, in a rich country. But that's not the case if you're a poor country that relies on people making medium or long haul flights from the main source markets as your main contributor to your business. I totally agree with Manda. I think we need to recognise as well that tourism is, is good for mental health, it's good for well-being, and try and increase opportunities for people who are not affluent enough to get on aeroplanes regularly to actually be able to indulge in leisure travel, which makes them feel better and improves their quality of life. Last, uh, last thing I think in particular I'd love to see is real progress, further progress being made in the cruise sector because I think I, I still may believe in some ways that the air industry has taken the brunt of the criticism and, and I understand that and so on. But I think the cruise industry too, although progress has been made by some companies in some areas, there are still issues around environmental impacts. There are still issues around their contribution to over tourism in the ports of call. And also some of the labor practices are ones that wouldn't necessarily be seen on land, but they are seen still on ships. So I think that's, that's, um, that's my bit. In terms of the book, I haven't forgotten that bit of the question, Harold, the book very quickly. Um, it needs rewriting. It needs rewriting by somebody else because so much has changed. It's a new world. But it should also look at why sustainable tourism to date has failed. And I think it, it ought to be looking at a couple of lessons that we can learn for the future from that. One is that top down doesn't work. Governments making policy statements, strategies, conferences and so on doesn't actually have a great influence. And secondly, the fact that there hasn't been enough consumer buy in. And because of that, I don't blame the consumers necessarily. I think some of it is, is a function of the fact there was far too much lecturing of consumers, telling them what was right, not giving them any incentive for doing right things and so on, just telling them they should do it and wagging fingers at them. But secondly, I think, again, it was also on a macro scale. Everything seemed too big, I think, that people thought, what can I do about that? It's too big a scale for me to deal with. And that's why, really, with Mandarin, you know, the work we do in Cornwall, I find actually quite satisfying because I think it starts at the local level. And if everybody at the local level is doing small things, big stuff happens at the macro level. So it's our responsibility as local destinations to do what we can to make sure that we build forms of tourism that are more sustainable. And I think, therefore, it's much more about bottom up than it is about top down. I think that's Thanks, John. There's a nice link there, actually, with what Manda was saying about thriving destinations. I think we'll probably yeah. come back to that in, in a yeah. moment. But let's first hear from 
Yehinia. Yehinia Unis was responsible for an enormous program of work that was done by by what was then WTO and became the, the UNWTO subsequently. I think you were there for about 15 years, Yehinia, and you and I worked together on a number of projects, as did Jane um, and John, I think. Yehinia, what's your perspective as somebody from the global south? You're, you're down there in Chile and with a, a, an understanding of what was happening internationally for 15 critical years of the movement for sustainable tourism. How do you see it? Well, thank you. And uh, let me start by saying that I agree with most of what uh, my colleagues in the panel have said. Uh, let me say that we are now uh, facing an, an excellent opportunity for the tourism sector to really change the, the, the way it was developing, if we can talk that of developing, I would say the way it was growing without really having a proper development strategy, sustainable development strategy. So we are facing a major crisis, and I fully agree with Manda in that this uh, health crisis, sanitary crisis, is very much linked to the climate crisis and the ecological crisis, and some, I would say, value crisis throughout the world, mm -hmm. because many countries, developed and less developed, are going through big processes of change, and nobody knows where society will be they're going in the next five or 10 years. So it's a global crisis and tourism is part of this global crisis. And therefore this moment is an excellent moment to revise our growth strategy and convert them into development strategies. And there I see a major role for governments to really formulate uh, uh, really committed policies on sustainability for the tourism sector, which has not been the case. I think most countries or most governments of different signs and of different levels of development have spoken about sustainability, but I haven't seen this speech translated into actual uh, legislation, actual regulations to be applied to the tourism industry. And I think without regulations, the, the sector will continue growing uh, as, uh, as we have seen it growing with exceptions, the 5 to 10% exceptions that Justin mentioned before. So on the one hand, uh, sustainability at the center of tourism policies, coupled with legislation and regulations. Secondly, also, uh, due uh, fiscalization and compliance to ensure that these, these regulations are being complied with by the tourism industry at large. Now, the other thing we've seen with this uh, uh, current crisis this year is that the industry was not prepared to face a major crisis. Although we've been talking about safety and security and preparedness, this was really an exception, but uh, most, uh, most companies and most governments were not prepared. So this industry is extremely vulnerable and therefore together with legislation for sustainable practices, we need also some kind of regulations for ensuring that destinations are safe and secure, that infrastructure is safe and secure and that tourists when traveling will get the necessary um, confidence to travel because destinations and companies are offering safe services. So let's leave it there for the moment, these three major points, legislation, regulation, fiscalization and compliance. Thanks very much, Eugenio. It seems to me that, that there are a number of many topics that come out of this. But can we start, Manda, by going back to your point about how you create thriving places for people to live in? Because at the heart of responsible tourism, right from the, from the kick-go, was the idea that we wanted to make better places for people to live in, because better places to live in, like Cornwall, are great places to visit. And that's uh, both a benefit and, to some extent, a curse for Cornwall, that so many people wanted to escape there from COVID 
So that's an aspect that we've not talked about, is the, the spreading of the disease through travel and tourism. But do you want to come back, John, maybe as well from a Cornwall perspective on what it takes to make tourism help Cornwall to thrive as a place to live? And I don't think Cornwall is different from any other destination in many ways. It's just that we have two people who happen to live there. Yeah. I, uh, thanks, Harold. Uh, go ahead, John. No, man the first, please. Uh, well, I was going to say quickly, uh, thank you for all of those comments. I think it's been really interesting to hear everybody else. Uh, I think this goes back to the, the crucial point of what tourism is for and whether tourism is for the place or whether the place is for tourism. And to my mind, uh, tourism has to be contributing to the place or it shouldn't be there. Um, it's if we're not looking at a really responsible, regenerative model for tourism, then you're looking at a prostitution of place, which in and of itself is a problem. But now you're also looking at um, the grip of on the on the industry of really big corporate bodies, which I don't think is yeah. very healthy. And you're looking at the potential to be a vector for disease. It's like, whoa, yes. we're going to do things wrong. Yeah. We've figured out how to do lots of things wrong all at the same time. But I think going back to, I think it was David Fleming that said um, that localism, the notion of localism mm. sits at the outside ring of possibility, but it does have in its favour that we have no alternative. So it's understanding how we contribute to yeah. local destinations. If it turns out, to my mind, and I'm sure John's got something to say here, <laughs> if it turns out that tourism is utterly, utterly required for any sort of thriving or international unsustainable tourism is required for a place to thrive, then there is something awry entirely with the infrastructure that we need to take responsible for globally. Yeah, yeah. Nobody should be that reliant on something. So if it goes away or it gets bad or broken, there is a problem. So it should be a contributor to local thriving. And I think it's something to do with local people having some level of um, a combination of the top-down stuff that Ekhani was talking about and people stepping up and having a responsibility for how their place is managed, whether it's just having a say in the local parish council or the fantastic models we've seen internationally, particularly in Latin America, mm -hmm. around participatory budgeting. How is our place managed? What do we think is important to contribute to it? That, and I hope we would see more and more of that in mm -hmm. Cornwall. Uh, interested in your thoughts on that, John. Yep, agree with all that, Mandarin, so on completely, and certainly the localism thing. And I, I think just a few quick points then. I think one of the things that is really important that, is that local communities make it clear to visitors how they see themselves, you know, what their view is about where they live, why where they live is important to them and their expectations of visitors, but also what visitors can expect from them. So it's a two way street. I also think it's about trying to, as I said earlier, integrate the two together as much as possible. One is living in a space permanently, one is living in the space temporarily, but they're all in the same space for a period of time. It's how we actually work well together, how we live together. And I think that's about trying to encourage them to live like we do. Um, you know, you must go to a place because there's something attractive about it. So, okay, go to the place and enjoy what local people enjoy. We love where we live because we're very fortunate and we want to share that with people. So if we tell you what our expectations are of your behavior, we then actually tell you what you can expect from us in terms of fair treatment and, and support and kindness and those kind of things. Encourage you to buy things locally, not to bring everything in with you um, to maximise the economic benefits. And just try and say, bring those two groups together and let people live like a local for a short period of time. And that, I think, reduces some of the unhappiness with visitors who sometimes believe, even here in Cornwall, that some of the folks who come down, it's a playground for them to use as they see fit because they've paid. It isn't. It's where we live. It's our home. And every destination is somebody's home. And therefore, it's about saying this is what's acceptable and this is what isn't acceptable. But in return, these are the things we're going to do to make sure your trip is even better. We enhance your experience. So you go home with fantastic memories of where you've been. That's what we're endeavouring to do at a very early stage, I think, down here. Um, and it's not easy, but I don't see any other way of doing it. I think that is the only way of making sure destinations, as you used to say, Harold, they use tourism, they don't get used by tourism. Yeah, that, uh, that aphorism that you hear so often in Southeast Asia in particular, that tourism is like a fire. You can use it to cook your food or it can burn your house down. Yes. It's so evidently true. Absolutely. Let me just push this on a bit, back perhaps more towards the regulatory side that Eugenio and, and, and Justin were raising. I'm often asked where the most successful de tourism destinations in terms of, of responsible tourism, and the two that always come to mind are Barcelona and Kerala. 
And the reason for that is that these are both areas of the world, one a city, one a, a state in India, where there's a very high level of local democracy backed up by a, a city authority in the case of Barcelona and by the state government in the case of Kerala. And what you've got is integrated government mm. engagement with the problem about how you manage tourism. And it's simply not true that tourism is not managed. Tourism is managed everywhere in the world by either the local authority or the national park authority. They do it well or, 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 or worse, obviously, but it is always managed. There's always somebody sorting out the traffic and the bins and the litter and the toilets and all the other things. The problem is, Yehini, I think, that we've focused a lot on what national governments can do because we have ministries of tourism. And we very rarely engage at that much more local level where the effective management of tourism is with the people responsible for planning a city or, or a, a national park, working out where the public transport goes, working out where the airport goes. Those things are normally done much more locally rather than by the Ministry of Tourism. And I think that's part of the problem. We've been focused on the wrong level of governance. Mm, yeah, uh, I think uh, you've touched a very interesting point, but uh, I, let me say, I don't agree, I agree that Barcelona is uh, trying, uh, the, we will see the, the, the mayor or, or mayoress of Barcelona very active in the field of tourism, which is very good, yet I don't see Barcelona as a success in terms of sustainable tourism because precisely Barcelona is one of the examples of over tourism and the local population reacting towards this excess tourism that they are living there. I don't know the case of Kerala, but probably it's, it's a better solution. Now, you're absolutely right in that uh, the local government have to be uh, much more active in managing tourism, but I will put an additional condition. And I think this is, should be in the agenda for a better tourism in the future, which is public-private partnership in managing tourism. Because even if you have a very active uh, local authority, but if they don't integrate the views and the preoccupations of the local community and of the local tourism operators as well is three parts. The local government, the tourism industry in that destination and the local population. Only with such a, a, a mixed management of tourism or governance of tourism, you may reach higher levels of responsibility in all the actors and better results for the tourism industry and especially for the community, which as uh, several of you have already mentioned, should be the beneficiary. I mean, tourism is not developed for the tourists. The tourists can enjoy, but if there is government intervention or at the central or local level, it's because there must be some benefit to the community. So if we don't put the accent there, uh, and if we don't integrate the government into the governance, the local population, as well as the local industry, we won't get the results we want from tourism. Um, also, I would like to raise another point, which is the, the need for, we've seen a lot of uh, efforts in the last five, uh, perhaps 10 years, on the use of information and communication technologies. But the risk there is that we will be leaving aside many aspects of sustainability, responsibility, climate consciousness, and so on, and giving much more power to big companies. And we've seen in the last few years the, um, the great power that the big info technology companies are taking also in the tourism sector. So there is an issue there that also needs to be tackled properly in order to ensure that small and medium-sized companies that are less able to get the latest information technologies and communication technology can survive in this extremely concentrated world. One of the things which was exciting for me about the first panel this morning from India was that they are now beginning to talk explicitly about PPC 
meaning public, private, and community partnerships. Mm. I think that's a really exciting mm. um, change, particularly coming from what was described by one of the audience in asking a question as the superpower tourism of India. Whether that's true or not, we wait to see. But it's quite a big shift. Um, and, and I'm optimistic about that, because I think in India, with the strong democratic structures around the panchayat, there's a real possibility. Justin, you raised the regulatory question. Are you at all optimistic that we'll see more regulation of government by government of tourism? Well, I mean, I, I, as you know, Harold, I'm more in the space of, um, of cherishing and encouraging brilliant entrepreneurship. Um, that's my great passion. Um, and you know, I believe for the first time now, the customers are, are willing, are with us. Um, you know, the thing about this crisis is it was caused by a breakdown of our relationship with the fragile world. That's what damaged economies around the world. Um, so I've always believed that um, this is a more enjoyable way to travel, as you know. Um, but at the same time as I'm passionate about entrepreneurship and the role of business, um, if you have freeloading businesses at the other end of the scale, that inhibits the progression of entrepreneurship. It prohibits the progression of great destination management. Um, so I'm not a, a specialist around regulation, but what I note um, around carbon um, is that with some exceptions, and perhaps you know, Jane's best place to talk about this, a lot of the uh, what's passed down by national governments who make binding commitments is voluntary. Um, not in every sector, but in some sectors, it's voluntary. <clears throat> I think that that's a great concern. And on the biodiversity side, we don't yet have the same simple targets that we have for a ton of carbon. We urgently need simple metrics for biodiversity that can drive change from consumers to industry to destinations. And I know from, um, from, the, from other work that I'm doing that that's coming along, coming along quickly. We need those two simple targets that people can grasp and get excited by, but we also need to push down the legislation if we're to let entrepreneurship flourish, which we must. Jane, when I reflect on the work you've been doing over the last 15 years, you've really driven a lot of progress in some very big players. But I've always had the sense that part of the problem has been the fact that other people are doing very little and that makes the competitive position very difficult for any business which is trying to behave much better than its competitors. It does make it harder than it would otherwise be. Am I misjudging that, or do you think there is a problem about what we do with those people who are doing very little at the bottom end of the market? Um, well, it's a few things, really. I think when it comes to um, when, it, when it comes to transparency and legislation nowadays for big businesses uh, and also investment um, with big businesses, uh, I can see the landscape changing very quickly in terms of. Um, investor expectation in terms of um, you know the rising costs of emitting carbon and how that's going to in impact on the industry in the next decade I and mean, just the impact of, of, um, of the EU's um, um, uh, the, the EC's proposal for a 55% uh, carbon reduction by 2030, moving up from 40% just a few weeks ago. You know we, we will see costs of, 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 of carbon. Um, Costing, costing more on every front, really, be it in hotels um, and, uh, and, and um, you know, wherever we're emitting carbon, it's going to cost us more. And then in terms of, in terms of transparency, um, I mean, you might have just seen yesterday uh, the new task force um, for climate related disclosure. Um, that's, uh, that's going to bring much more disclosure in terms of reporting um, in meaningful terms on the impact that businesses have on climate change and conversely, so how, how, how businesses are going to be impacted by climate change and conversely, um, conversely the transition risks of, 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 of businesses and how they're going to transition to a net zero world. So I think, I think things are changing very quickly on that front. And one of, the, um, one of the sort of highlights for me this year is how environmental, social and governance uh, investment funds have stood up, um, outperformed um, uh, other stocks um, sort of by 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 a, by a long way, so um, so 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 that's that's useful. Um, I think 
I mean, there's no doubting that there is a lot of pent up demand to travel uh, and that, you know, we can see that whenever quarantine restrictions have been taken off, um, you know, business, so for instance, the Canaries recently, I mean, literally sort of 900% increase in bookings overnight. I mean, it's really, you know, people are going to, going to want to travel um, and there's going to be people, obviously businesses are going to take advantage of that. I think one of the key things um, uh, that businesses need to do, and I think it was mentioned by, by John actually in terms of choice editing, um, because yes, people's expectations have changed. People say they're, they're concerned about climate change uh, and, and they definitely have got a heightened awareness of impact on community and on climate. But when it comes to booking your holiday, when you haven't traveled all year and you're desperate to get away, uh, in my experiences, people do tend to sometimes say things in, in, in research and then, and then do another. And I think, I think the onus has to be um, on the, uh, the larger uh, travel providers in particular um, to choice edit. And um, yeah, it was encouraging uh, and uh, I can't take credit for this because EasyJet holidays were set up before I arrived, but um, in, terms of, um, in, in terms of what's in integrated into supplier contracts, in terms of expectations on hotels uh, to move towards certification, in terms of uh, the carbon offsetting of the flights, um, in terms of deciding um, not to uh, operate in certain areas uh, because of um, uh, reputational or animal rights issues, uh, in terms of prioritizing a kind of undiscovered range to try to spread the benefits of tourism to areas that are looking to develop tourism that certainly haven't suffered from over tourism, far from it, are, are very keen to develop tourism and haven't had so much of a look in um, over, over the years. Um, so I think, I think choice editing is, is critical. You can't legislate for that, but in terms of expectations on responsible business, uh, that, is, that is really a driver from, from, from city, from governments, from public, from media, et cetera. Jane, in the way in which that, that's being done within EasyJet, for example, does that mean conversations are taking place between the people developing the holidays and the destinations that they're choosing to feature, or is the conversation entirely with the private sector? Um, well, I think you spoke to Gary, the MD of EastJet Holidays, the other day, didn't you? Um, so, yes, yeah, certainly he alluded to the conversations that had taken place with, with, with destinations um, and obviously been working very, very closely with destinations um, over, over the course of this year in terms of response um, to the pandemic. But prior to that as well, in terms of, in, in, in terms of, uh, of, of, of tourism and tourism. Players. Jane, I wasn't trying to catch you out. I was just <laughs> wanting to make sure that the people listening to this conversation know what Gary said in the previous one, which you will be able to get on the WCM Hub in due course. Gary said some extremely interesting things about the way tourism would develop um, with the EasyJet holidays. Mandy, can I just come back to Cornwall, Amanda and John, because Malcolm Bell was, one on, the, was on the panel yesterday mm. morning, and he was saying that from a destination management point of view, one of the problems now is how you communicate, as it were, beyond Cornwall to people and say, look, Cornwall's actually full now. You know, we really, really, please don't come. You know, the sea is full, the beaches are full, there's nowhere to stay. Please don't come. And we saw the mas massive backlash against the Scottish police, Police Scotland, when they were giving out advice about not going to Sky, and that was last summer. Um, I think there's a real problem here about how a destination mm. copes with large numbers of visitors when the place is actually full and really cannot absorb any more. Mm. We just don't have a system for that, do we? No. No, I mean, there have there have been problems across the UK. I can't speak for, I, mean, I know there have been issues everywhere else, but there have definitely been problems um, in uh, hotspots across the UK. For all sorts of reasons, number of people, sorts of behaviour, not quite sure if it's the same people or different people or different behaviour. Um, but I would say in, re in response to that, that it's not just um, down to the destination to try and manage that mm. or to figure out a way of communicating in such a way that people behave in a way that's contributing well. I think it's part of a much bigger structural problem. People are told they deserve a holiday. People are they're entitled to um take something that allows them to cope with the fact that the rest of their life might be quite tricky. It's part of, um, it's been once described as coming to, to Cornwall on holiday as, part of, as a survival mechanism, part of a way of surviving a difficult and unsustainable life elsewhere. I think we need to understand what it is that's made people, make, making people take very, very, very long journeys when they could be enjoying what there is locally. I know this is complex on a global scale, mm. but we need to understand it as part of a bigger system where people 
are being pushed to take and to have a sense of entitlement, um, a privilege which slurs into entitlement. And I would say that if we can find a way of understanding the notion that Eleanor Ostrom talked about, that notion of a shared asset and seeing a place as a shared asset, and if we were able to do that everywhere and that people had a right to contribute to how it's managed, and that happened absolutely everywhere, because everybody's a visitor or a tourist somewhere else, then we might have a slightly different understanding of responsibility and privilege. And we might behave better when we go elsewhere. We might not think that in actual fact it's our right to treat tourism as the next extractive industry by going somewhere else and having a negative impact there or having a neg negative impact in terms of how you get there. So I think it's to do with a much wider cultural um, re-understanding of what it is to be a visitor, what it is to be in your own place, what it is to be in somebody else's place, um, and understand that we won't be able to have everything that we think we're entitled to have yeah. in the coming years. Yeah. And we haven't made that shift yet. Mm. And it would be great if we can get in front of it rather than have it mm. thrown at us. Yeah. John, I'm sure you've got some yeah, I'm going to come to John in a second. I just want to yeah. point out it's taken us to 46 minutes into this conversation for somebody to get close to saying that we live in a finite world and we can't have unlimited growth. <laughs> and that surely is the basic reality that lies behind all of this. John? Yeah, um, I think two or three points on, on, on that, Harold, and so on. One is that although Malcolm's absolutely right and so on. Large parts of Cornwall this year were, were full to the point of being dangerous in terms of access for emergency vehicles, for example. Absolutely right. But there were other parts of the county that had none whatsoever in terms of tourists, or very, very few. And they tend to be the parts of the county with lower, lower wages and higher unemployment. So there is an issue about how you move tourists around and try and get them to look at areas that would like a few more tourists and could cope with some more tourists. The second thing I think is, is become much smarter to working with social media influencers because a lot of the people who come here and so on to Cornwall, they're not doing it because of things that have been sent to them as publicity by Visit Cornwall or anybody else for that matter. It's because it gets on social media with various influencers who say this is the place to be this year and we need to be smarter at how we deal with that. And thirdly, although we're really lucky here with having a high percentage of repeat visitors, I would like us to drive more and more to get more and more people who come back year after year, because I think once you have that relationship with a, with a customer, with a visitor, you have a better chance to actually influence their behaviour and build a proper relationship with a customer rather than somebody who just comes once and runs away and never comes back again. I think this year, because of COVID has been odd, we've had some people who've never been to Cornwall before, which is quite unusual, actually. They, I think, have sometimes found it difficult to understand what being a tourist in Cornwall is all about. Some of the behaviours have been not not deliberately bad, I don't think, but just not understanding the expectations of what how you should behave with wildlife, how you should, where you can camp and where you shouldn't actually be rough camping and stuff like that. Having said that, though, just a last point, Harold, I think we in Cornwall and a lot of rural Britain have got to be really, really careful that we don't become too critical of visitors who came down here from big cities. We've had, thank goodness, a very few deaths relative in Cornwall from, from COVID. We've have, we're having visitors from cities who are hemmed in to cities and so on, where hundreds and hundreds of people have died. We've just got to recognise the fact that we are here to be a kind of playground for people if they're prepared to behave properly and if they want to contribute to the well-being of people in Cornwall, they're very, very welcome. And we should manage them as well as we possibly can to make sure they have a good time and we get what we need out of tourism as well. One of the things that Malcolm said yesterday, which I think hit the nail on the head, was you've got a lot of people coming to Cornwall who were used to going to Mediterranean beach resorts. Yes. And actually the sea in Cornwall isn't quite the same. And I think that is a, <laughs> it's a big help. It's and it's clean, issue. Harold. It's bluer and cleaner, <laughs> but it's certainly not as safe to bathe in in the normal way. And the cliffs That's are pretty dangerous right. in Cornwall. Absolutely right. I, I must say, we've had that. You know, I'll come to you in one second, and then we're going to go around the final... Lap. But I need to be honest and say we've had a massive increase in the number of day visitors to the small town in Kent where I live and yeah. nobody's to reveal the name of this place, John, don't you dare. <laughs> the, um, but but we found people saying to those visitors, lovely to see you, great you're enjoying it, we love yeah. it too, please don't tell too many people about us. Yes. Eugenio. Yeah, I want to, to go back to what Manda said about uh, uh, the the cultural aspect. I think it's very important the role that uh, the, the tourism industry can play in, in addition of selling services and advising or where to go, what to see, etc. a kind of educational role to their customers as well. 
not only to respect the local people, but also to understand, to, for the tourists to understand that they have this privilege and that they, this is an opportunity to get to know mm. how other people live, how the, the biodiversity in such and such a place is in danger. So I miss that in the role that big and small tourism companies play. I think they put a lot of emphasis on providing information uh, related to spending, which is fine. I mean, the economic impact of tourism for destination is really important. And it's not only that. I think the local people and the local uh, environment deserve a better treatment from the visitors. And that can only be done or can mostly be done by the tourism companies that are selling those services. And when I mean tourism companies, given that today the role of the travel agent and the tour operator is less important than it used to be, also the OTAs have a major role to play. I remember uh, advising one big uh, OTA, which operates mainly in Latin America, about providing information about the sustainability of destinations and the, the level of sustainability of individual operators, hotels, of tour operators, etc. They said, oh, that's very interesting, but they haven't done it. And I think it's very important if we, if we convince major OTAs to provide that information that will help educating tourists before they visit the destination. Justin, I have a feeling that Hino has just set that up for you. <laughs> um, yes, but do you mind if I um, ignore that and, and raise one last point? <laughs> just ignore the... Do, do, Justin, whether I mind or not won't make any difference. Just go ahead. <laughs> okay. I just want to talk about biodiversity, Harold. Um, I want to talk about it because it's as big a threat as climate change, and it's absolutely related to climate change. We need a healthy ecosystem to sequester carbon naturally. Mm. And I'm excited about tourism's potential there. I'm really excited by what we can do. We need to expand the amount of land that we have that's healthy and protected. And nature tourism, if it's moved from a, the preserve of the rich and the white, I think can play a, a really important role in that, alongside many other things. Um, you know, we're not going to solve that on our own. But, you know, I'm up for and excited about our industry's potential to really restore and rewild wildlife. I think we've got a great opportunity. We're coming really to the end now. We're down to the last eight minutes, which gives you each about two minutes to, or a bit less than two minutes, to say the one thing that you would want people to do to make a difference over the coming two years. But I'm going to start with you, John. I thought you might. Yeah, thanks for that, Harold. Um, I think what I would like to do is just see everybody who travels ever as a tourist, which is pretty well most of us certainly were watching this at the moment, thinks seriously about what they actually do themselves. Instead of always talking about what other people should be doing, actually look at our own choices and think responsible tourism when we actually make our own choices. It's very easy to tell other people what they should be doing, but we don't always practice what we preach. And I totally agree with what Justin's just been saying about biodiversity and rewilding. Absolutely agree. Eugenio. Well, uh, what I would like to see is a real application of a lot of know-how that has been developed for the last 20 or even more, 25 years. And that uh, with you, Harold and Jane as well, we had many joint opportunities to uh, uh, develop these, uh, uh, these techniques for more sustainable and responsible tourism. Unfortunately, the level of application has been rather low. And I would like to see a more committed industry and committed governments to uh, uh, really implement the know-how. I don't think the know-how is, uh, is lacking. It is there, it has been there for at least two decades, and what we need is real application. And one, one element for that is legislation, as I said before. Thanks, Eugenio. Justin. 
It's a tough question. I mean, I was minded, Harold, you know, to, to talk about thinking of ourselves as guests, you know, guests in communities, guests on the planet. Um, but really, you know, just do something. Just, that's all of us. If we're leaders, just do something more. If we're watching and we're interested, take the first step. Um, and, um, and if you are seeing people in your sector, in your destination, or doing nothing, then take action. So it's a, a movement from top to bottom, and we just all need to, to uh, buckle down because this is, this is crunch time now. The next 10 years, we lose biodiversity in the next 10 years. We lose the climate change battle in the next 10 years. Time is pressing on. Uh, we've got to get to grips and, and, um, and really, um, I don't want to have any regrets, Harold. Yeah. You know, when I'm even older, I don't want to have any regrets and I feel like now is the time. You and I have talked about the even tide rest home before, Justin. I don't want to be there either. And I'm very worried about what the future is for our children. <laughs> Jane. Um, I, what, what, what Eugenio said resonated a lot with me. We spent um, a lot of time developing tools which we know work. So um, uh, GSTC recognized hotel certifications. Um, you know, I, we, we know that hotels that have been through that process um, markedly reduce their negative impacts on the environment, um, have, have a, a really more positive impact on local businesses, uh, have better employment processes. And, uh, and, and from a business case, we have higher, customers with high, far higher satisfaction. So it, it makes sense and it would be great to see more travel providers highlighting certified, certified hotels and, and, and pushing that. And, and the other point um, Eugenia said earlier, um, which really resonated with me was um, actually getting stakeholders in destinations from different parts of the tourism chain, community groups, um, local government uh, together to look at that, that, that holistic management of, 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 of destinations. And time and time again, when I've been involved in destination projects and we've kicked off with those kind of multi-stakeholder forums, people have said, this has been so productive and we've never ever done this before in this destination. So uh, again, looking at the GSTC uh, destination certification processes and assessment tools uh, and getting those stakeholders together and measuring, measuring really what matters in destinations, identifying those KPIs for the destination uh, and, and measuring and monitoring, improving those. Um, those Thank you, Jane. So, We're really up against it, Manda. Okay, very, very quickly. Uh, uh, we are in a state of multiple emergencies and we have never had it this bad before, but so much potential for change. We can't wait for the state um, and we can't wait for the market. We need to step up and do something about this individually, as has been said before. We need to move up, stop using old tools in this very new reality and bashing even hard with old tools. They're the wrong tools. We need completely different tools. We need to move not as protected areas. We don't need protected areas. We need better areas by default it's the wrong paradigm we are we are moving the good stuff into a small space where we need to assume that that is um, the way to go we need to move from extraction to a shared asset and finally we need some positive deviance which is step up and say we need to do this really differently now we can take our example from emperor penguins they huddle around in a big group and make sure that the ones that are on the outside that are cold are brought in and rewarmed, and the ones that are warm go outside and, and take a hit on the cold to make sure that the whole group of penguins survive in adverse circumstances. And the question I can never answer is if penguins can look after each other, <laughs> why in God's name can't we do that across the planet? That's my big question. Don't think I have the answer to that. And I'm being told we mu I must wrap up now. Can I just say thank you very much to all of you? Can I also say that we are planning to run more of these discussions through the year and I'll be back in touch with all of you. So a lot of ideas come out this afternoon, which I think we should have particular sessions focusing on. And it's great to be able to bring people because of using this technology from all around the world to participate in the same discussion. So thank you very much. I hope the people who've been watching this have got a lot from it. I certainly have, and thank you very much to the panel. Thank you very much indeed. There will be thank more. Thank you to everybody. Thank, thank you. you, goodbye. Thanks, Harold, bye.